Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Sunday Night Video. This week I am covering the story of the tragic explosion which took place on the town moor in Newcastle upon Tyne in 1867, resulting in the loss of seven lives. And sadly, it seems that two of those who died, the younger boys, should not even have been there, simply going along out of curiosity. I hope you will find it interesting. But before we begin, if you do enjoy this video, then please give it a thumbs up. And if you are new here or haven't already done so, then do please consider subscribing to the channel to help support the content we create. Thank you. It is completely free to subscribe. It doesn't cost you any money, but it really does help to support the channel. And I would just like to add, as I always do now, that I do record these stories live, so I do sometimes make mistakes, which I always try to rectify, so I hope this does not spoil your enjoyment of the video. On December the 17th, 1867, a group of men consisting of John Mawson, who was 53, Thomas Bryson, who was 65, Donald Bain, who was 45, James Shotton, who was 23, George Stonehouse, who was 14, Samuel Wadley, with no age, Thomas Appleby, who was 20, and Mr Isaac Bell, took several canisters of nitroglycerin from the White Swan Public House in Newcastle, with the intention of taking them to the town moor to dispose of them in a large hole in the ground that had once been part of some old mine workings. The nitroglycerin had been found stored in the White Swan unknown to the innkeeper, who had been under the impression that it was simply grease. On realising how dangerous it was, it was decided that destroying it was the best thing to do. When the men arrived at the town moor, they set about emptying the containers of nitroglycerin into the first hole. On opening some containers, it was found that the contents had crystallised. This had made it slightly harder to remove and some of the contents had to be prized out with the use of a shovel. John Mawson had decided that he would like to keep a piece of this crystallised substance and he had broken one piece in two and asked for some paper to wrap it in. The remaining part had been thrown into the hole. It was decided that the containers which had the crystallised substance in them should be buried in another hole and several of the men began heading towards the second hole, leaving one man behind, Mr Bell, at the first hole to bury the liquid nitroglycerin that had already been poured into it. Mr Bell was busy covering the hole which contained the liquid with soil, while the other seven men were walking towards the second hole, with three of the men carrying an opened canister each. Mr Bell had just finished filling in the first hole and was about to join the others when a dreadful explosion took place in the direction of the second hole. Three other police officers who had joined the party of men at the town moor were the first on the scene of the explosion and they were met with a most dreadful sight. It was clear that for some of the men, Bain, Shotton, Appleby and Stonehouse, nothing could be done. But three of the men, Mawson, Bryson and Wadley, were immediately sent by cart to the Newcastle Infirmary. Samuel Wadley died just two hours after his arrival at the infirmary, and Thomas Bryson died at 1.30am on December the 19th, and John Mawson died at around 3am, also on the 19th. An inquest was held into the deaths of all of the men. However, the one that I am taking the information from is for John Mawson, but the details given are the same for all of the inquests. The inquest was held at Newcastle before Coroner Hoyle. At two points during the course of the inquest, exhibits of nitroglycerin were produced to the jury. On one occasion it was a small piece of the crystallised matter and on another it was a partially empty canister and on both occasions the jury and the coroner asked for it to be removed immediately. I found this absolutely bizarre. Seven men had just died and no one truly knew what had caused the nitroglycerin to explode and yet they felt it was safe to bring it to the inquest and I am not surprised that no one wanted it in the room. Inspector Amos said the police had been called to inspect a possible explosive sub substance that was being stored in the White Swan public house in Newcastle, and on examining it, it was believed to be nitroglycerin, and it was deemed to be too dangerous to be left where it was. 
Discussions were held on how best to destroy it, and it was decided that it should be taken to the town moor and buried. John Mawson would be in charge. It was thought as a chemist he would know the best way to dispose of the nitroglycerin. And John Mawson was also the sheriff of Newcastle at that time. Inspector Wallace stated that he felt there was little to no danger as Mr Mawson knew what he was doing. He felt that perhaps the movement or someone dropping one of the canisters had caused the explosion. He did not see anyone with any smoke or fire near the canisters at any time. PC Stevenson made a very similar statement to that of Inspector Wallace. Both men stated that the canisters had been carefully transported to the town were by cart and in their opinion it had been carefully handled. Mr Bell stated that he had studied chemistry himself for many years and was aware of the dangers of nitroglycerin. He believed that Mr Mawson was also aware and said that he felt every precaution had been taken when transporting the canisters to the burial site. He did state that even a tiny change in temperature could cause it to explode and that once crystallised it was even more volatile. I must admit, when I read this, I found it very strange that he did not tell the man, the men carrying it to the second hall that it was very dangerous and could easily explode, but no one at the inquest seems to have questioned him as to why he did not tell them this. On the night in question, Mr Bell said that on arriving at the town moor, Mr Mawson had directed them to take the canisters one at a time into the hall, remove the bungs and pour the liquid into the soil. He said they did this without much problem and the liquid quickly vanished. Although he did say there was quite a strong smell like polish. They continued to do this until they came upon some that seemed to him to be heavier than the others. It was then decided to remove the bottoms of these to see what the issue was. He said that some of the canisters were easy to open but some had to be prized apart by using a shovel. The substance in these had crystallised. He said Mr Mawson said he would like to keep a piece of this material, though I have to say I cannot understand why, as even the smallest piece could still ignite. However, Mr Bell continued by saying that a piece was broken in half and Mr Mawson asked for some paper to wrap it in, but he said he was unsure what happened to it after this, but the remaining piece was thrown into the first hole. He said it was after this that Mr Mawson decided to bury the canisters with the crystallised substance in the second hole and he told him, Mr Bell, to cover the first hole with soil and ash. He said he then went to do this and the rest of the men set off towards the second hole a short distance away with three of the men carrying the canisters and the others following close by. He said he had completed his task and was about to leave the hole and join the others when there was a fearful explosion. He said there was a foul smell in the air and this made him feel quite sick. In fact, he said it almost knocked him senseless and he was ill for quite some time. He continued by saying that he did not remember much about the explosion, but he saw the debris from the second hole falling all around him and also spreading a great distance away. And he said he did not see the seven men alive again. He said that P.C. Stevenson and P.C. Casely were close by him at the top of the first hole as they had not followed the others and they were some of the first to head towards the second hole. He then spoke of the devastation around him. He said it was awful to see. Andrew Bolton said he was the resident surgeon at the Newcastle Infirmary. He had been on duty when the three survivors had been brought in. He said John Mawson had severe wounds to his face and body. He was blind and was struggling to hear. Thomas Bryson had similar injuries and also a broken leg. He said that both men had lingered in a very poor state for a short time and sadly both had eventually succumbed to their injuries and died in the early hours of December the 19th. Andrew continued saying that when Samuel Wadley was brought into the infirmary he seemed to be suffering from shock and concussion. However, he had died just two hours after his arrival. No details were given of any post-mortems, but it is to be assumed that all of the men would have died as a result of their injuries from the explosion. Mr Bell had spoken at one point of seeing a second man near to the second hall shortly before the explosion. He said he had been wearing a white hat 
and he said later the hat had been found but no sign of the man and he had thought he too may have been killed. However, the man had later turned up at one of the police hearings. He stated that he had indeed been close to the explosion and the blast had blown one of his ears clean off. He had wrapped something around his head, he said, and made his way to the hospital. The possible cause of the explosion was discussed and it was suggested that when the first man placed his canisters into the hole safely, the second man may have fallen or tripped and dropped his cause in the explosion and the third man would have been caught in the blast, also causing his canisters to explode. These men and anyone close by would have caught the full blast with no chance of survival. Of course, it is impossible to say if this truly was the cause of the explosion, but it seemed to be a reasonable theory at the time. No further evidence was given and the jury retired for around 15 minutes before returning a verdict that death had been caused by an accidental explosion of nitroglycerin and they also expressed the concern that the canisters had never been stored properly by their owner. The day after the explosion, Inspector Hall, Sergeant Hippel and several other police officers had the unhappy task of searching the town moor for body parts. The force of the explosion had sent some quite some distance away and it would appear that shouts went up all day as men said they had found a finger or a foot or worse. I am not going to go into detail as I am sure you can imagine how a blast so close to a person is going to cause great damage to the bodies. All I was, will say is that some parts were found as far away as the fever hospital and even on the roof. I cannot even begin to imagine how the families of those who had died must have felt at this point in time. However, the police and other volunteers worked tirelessly and it was hoped that all had been recovered and nothing had been missed by the end of the search. One of the newspapers at the time of the explosion covered the funerals in great detail, however I will only cover the basics. John Mawson was buried in Jesmond Old Cemetery. The procession had started from his home in Gateshead and it was said that by the time it reached Newcastle it stretched for at least a mile as so many had joined in behind the hearse. After the service it was said that many floral tributes had been placed across the grave. Thomas Bryson was also buried at Jesmond Old Cemetery. Although slightly smaller, the procession following the hearse to the cemetery contained almost 170 of Thomas's friends on foot. The Reverend J. H. Rutherford conducted the service. Although I am aware that there is a headstone for Thomas, I was not able to find it when I was last at the cemetery. The funeral of P.C. Donald Bain took place at St. Andrew's Cemetery in Newcastle. The procession behind the hearse included over 60 police officers on foot, as well as many family members in carriages, and the Reverend W. Walters conducted the service. George Stonehouse was buried at St John's Cemetery on Elswick Lane and I believe this is now known as Elswick Road. It was said that behind his coffin, 20 of his friends walked wearing white gloves and black armbands. The Reverend B. W. Carr conducted the service. Samuel Bod Wadley was also buried in St John's Church and the Reverend B. W. Carr also conducted the service. And although there is no other information about his funeral, it was said that he was buried close to George Stonehouse. Sadly, the information for the burials of both Thomas Appleby and James Shotton were very basic. It was simply stated that Thomas was buried at Heweth and James at Westgate Cemetery. Later, investigations took place discussing how the canisters of nitroglycerin had ended up in the Swan Inn public house in the first place. The alleged owner at the time had been a man by the name of John Spark, who said he was an auctioneer. He stated that a man by the name of Mr Burrell had been the original owner. However, he had left for a job in India a few weeks before the explosion, and Mr Spark had come into possession of the items as part of the belongings left behind by Mr Burrell. He stated he had not fully known what was in the canisters and had made no attempt to sell any of them. He said the suppliers, a company from Wigan, had later written to him asking him to sell the items on their behalf with a 5% commission. 
He said he did not feel inclined as the money did not seem worth it. However, arrangements had been made for the firm to visit and discuss matters in 10 days' time. He said he was not aware that the canisters were dangerous. However, the owner of the public house had said he wanted them removed from his premises, and he said he did not have permission to do this, and he had consulted the police on the matter, and this was how they had found the canisters and decided to destroy them. The agent for the company who originally owned the canisters travelled to Newcastle to give evidence and the agent stated that only someone with experience in dealing with nitroglycerin should have destroyed it. He said that he was not surprised it had exploded if it had not been handled correctly. It seems that he had intended to deal with the matter. However, before he was able to make the journey to Newcastle, the canisters had been removed by Mr Mawson and others, and sadly the results had been tragic. And it must be added here that the day after the explosion, a further five or six canisters had been buried on the town moor, though thankfully this time without incident. It seems that in the end, no one was held responsible. It seems that Mr Spark did not feel he was the rightful owner, and Mr Webb had not been able to arrive in time to remove them safely, and Mr Burrell, who had left them behind, did not seem to have left any contact details. This, no doubt, would have left the verdict as it stood, accidental death. A relief fund was set up for the families of the victims of the explosion, and it was said that the money would be distributed between the families as determined by the Mayor of Newcastle, the Chairman of the Watch Committee and the Town Clerk. Many people had given money to the cause, and one which stood out was a £15 donation by Sir William Armstrong, the man who is responsible for building Cragside in Northumberland. Now before I do my little postscript, I would like to add that I have read a couple of other accounts of this explosion written a few le years later and they gave a somewhat different account in many areas. However, I have chosen to stay with the details that were shared via the inquest and the police inquiry in the local newspapers in 1867. This was a very sad story, but also a very strange one. If Mr Mawson was supposed to be aware of the dangers of nitroglycerin, it seems strange that he allowed them to be transported to the town moor by cart, which surely would have disturbed the con contents as they bounced along over the cobbled streets, which is what they would have been back then. It also seems odd that he allowed them to be carried by hand from one place to another, when it seemed to be known that movement could cause them to explode. Surely this was simply asking for trouble. I also have to ask why they were moved in the first place. It's easy to understand they were not stored in the correct place, but surely waiting for someone experienced in dealing with the substance to arrive and advise made more sense than taking them away with little idea of how dangerous it was to move them. Was this an accident that could have been avoided? Well, personally, I think it was. I would have left it to the experts. But perhaps those who wanted them moved felt the risk was very small and so therefore it was worth taking a chance to get rid of them as quickly as possible. Sadly, this turned out to be the wrong choice and a sad and absolute horrendous death for seven innocent men. As always though, what do you think? Do you think John Mawson was experienced enough to be in charge of destroying the nitroglycerin or should he have waited for the experts to arrive? Do you think those involved did not really understand the risks involved? And if you had been alive at the time and someone asked you to help destroy some explosives, would you have said yes or been like me and ran in the opposite direction as fast as you could? Do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I do hope that you have found this sad and very tragic story interesting and I do thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon.